Good to see all of you in the house of the Lord tonight. Got a lot of folks out of pocket here, there, and yonder, every direction in the world. But it happens sometimes. And I um, do want to mention a few things to you. Uh, Mother's Day happened, and we're still in the month of May, and our offerings are going to Mother's Memorial. And then if any, any of you ladies give $100, then they'll give you a pen. Isn't that nice? I'm not talking about a pen you pin on your blouse. I'm talking about a writing pen, fancy doodad writing pen. And, of course, Father's Day is coming up soon, so you need to get your photos in of your dads if you haven't done that yet. Um, a lot of small group activity. In fact, this Sunday is Words with Friends. Brother Friends should be ministering to us. Sunday night, Words with Friends. And I think there's a lot going on this weekend. Actually, Friday night is the... Uh, family fun night, game night, and s Saturday is the, oh, board games. Saturday is the family get-together stuff, and Friday is the board game. So a lot of stuff this weekend, real busy weekend for us. A lot of things happening. And, of course, before you know it, a month away, vacation Bible school. Of course, first part of July, camp meeting, and, of course, children's camps will be going on in the month of June. So June is... Here soon, halfway through the month of May to June. We're going to do our confession, so if you would stand with me and repeat after me. My body is the temple of the Lord. Strong and healthy. Every sickness, every disease, every virus, every plague, every germ, every allergy that comes near my body or my family, or my church family, or my dwelling, dies instantly in Jesus' name. I am covered by the blood of Jesus. I believe and receive all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank him. Father, we thank you, praise you, magnify you for your grace and your mercy. You are so magnanimous and so wonderful. We praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. A lot of folks out of pocket, and so we don't have any singing tonight. So I'll just be getting into the word quickly here. And I'm sure there will be some other folks that come, come in. Sister Amy, tell your husband we have an air conditioning unit that was making a big bad noise, and we turned it off. So, so we, um, you know, you send out for the uh, Calvary to come in, or, you know, for that matter, hey, we can tell her husband. doesn't matter to me which one of you tell your husbands, but they need to know. <laughs> so, and we are going to be blessed with a little bit cooler weather coming this week, which is uh, something nice since we've had near record temperatures this week. Of course, now, Brother Ben out there in California would tell you that we don't know what heat is because he lives in Palm Springs, and it's uh, really brutal out there. But, you know, we have a different kind of brutality here when it comes to heat. So, um, I want to direct your attention to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3. And I started a series, the third lesson on a series of messages that I've entitled, The Truth About Prophecy. The Truth About Prophecy and looking at the book of 1 Samuel and... Um, Interesting that when you read the Word of God, there will be times where we'll have um, chapter 2, verse 27 is where I'm going to be, 1 Samuel 2, 27. You will have um, different prophets that come along, and what's interesting to me is that sometimes there are people who are unnamed, and they'll just refer to them as like the man of God, and this is one of those examples here in 1 Samuel 2, and usually these people that don't really have names, or they have names, it's just that we don't know what their names are. Um, what transpires with them is that um, we, um, we don't know what their names are, and we don't tend to remember them as well as we do those who their names are given. So, picking up at 1 Samuel 2 and 27, and there came a man of God, unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, did I plainly appear unto thy house, unto the house of thy father, when they were in Egypt, in Pharaoh's house. 
And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? And he's talking about Levi, the son of the fourth son of Jacob. I chose him to be my priest out of all, uh, out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod. And before me did I give unto him the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and thy house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house, and thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation in the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever, and the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be consumed, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age, and this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them, and I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine eye before mine anointed forever, and it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. Amen. The truth about prophecy, part three. Father, we thank you for your word. We magnify you. We praise you for your grace. We glorify you for all of your many blessings. We thank you for the chance to, to be here in the house of the Lord and to hear your word. We know that the word of God is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. So, um, lengthy portion there. All of those words that I read from verse 27 to 36 were the words of this unnamed man of God as he came in prophecy and uh, was prophesying to Eli. Have no idea what his name is, don't know anything about him, don't know where he came from, we don't know if Eli knew him, uh, we don't know any of those particulars, but one of the things that we, we see in the Old Testament about prophets is they just come out of nowhere. They don't have any family, they don't have any towns usually, they don't have, when I, now obviously they do have family, but we just don't know who they are. They just show up. Now, there's once in a while, when I, like I, I told you I love Ahijah the Shilonite, we actually know where he's from. He's from Shiloh, hence the name Shilonite. But usually, these prophets, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about them, Brother French. We don't know where they came from. Nathan, when he appears the first time, he just, poof, he's there. No background, don't know his parents, don't know his tribe, don't know his town, his hometown, nothing. Boom, he's just there. And so this man of God, it doesn't even tell us his name, just a man of God that comes and delivers the word of the Lord unto Samuel. Now, last week I read to you half a chapter in Joel, and I'm cognizant of the clock, and I'm going to be trying to take you back there today toward the end of this lesson and go back, and we're going to look at Joel 2. But um, today I want to kind of look at some prophecies, and we were dealing with some things. And here's the reason why I call this series the truth about prophecy. It's because what I have found, as I told you, in, in all of my years, uh, there's all kinds of subjects in the Word of God, and I, I feel like I can study any of them, but prophecy is just one of those things. And I realized, I just came to this, had this aha, Elder French, the aha I had is the reason why all these other prophecy preachers got this, all this information is they just make stuff up. Now, I'm not throwing rocks at all, Mr. Lula. <laughs> But what I am saying is this. I want you to understand something that's very important. 
People use human logic, and sometimes their human logic is, is not even logic. I had a student one time in West Virginia. She was the best debater on my debate team. And you would think that if you're a great debater, you'd be really good at logic. And the school that I was principal, I mean, I, that I taught in, I wasn't principal, the school that I taught in was on a dead-end street. And you know how it is, traffic is busy in the mornings and traffic is busy in the afternoons and a dead end street and there was a four way stop right there up the hill from where the school was and that four way stop, one road coming in dead end into, our, into where our street was and, um, and every morning there would be a police officer that was there directing traffic and the police officer would direct traffic, congestion, cars everywhere you know, because of all that early morning traffic, people going to work, people come bringing their kids to school, dropping them off, et cetera. And, um, and so all of that was real busy. And so the debate class met at the beginning of the day, the first class of the day. And sometimes there'd be debates. Now, here's the problem with a debate. A debate, if you use all the common of times, two people against two people, the debate is 90 minutes long. So the day of a debate, four students involved, I required them, you're going to have to come to school 30, 40 minutes early and start the debate. It'll just be me in the room and the four debaters. And I said, the rest of you, when you get here, you don't have to come early. If you want to come early, you can. But, it, you know, but when you get here, you come in the door quietly and sit down quietly and don't disturb these people. So this girl, the best debater, and by the way, her name was Jackie. And... I mean, she was the best debater I had. She was the best one. And she came in, and she says, Mr. Greer, that police officer they have out there every morning is causing the traffic jam. I said, what are you talking about, Jackie? She said, I've been coming to school, and I went to the junior high, and she said, there's always a traffic jam up there, and the policeman's there. And she said, and today, when I got here, the policeman wasn't there yet, and there's no traffic jam. The policeman caused the traffic jam. I said, Jackie, there's nobody here yet. <laughs> there's no traffic jam because school doesn't start for 35 more minutes. Nobody coming early. <laughs> there's only four cars in the parking lot. <laughs> the police officer did not cause the traffic jam. The traffic jam caused the police officer. And so you can have correlation, and sometimes you have correlation and there's no causality. And sometimes there's causality. But the rain causes you to carry an umbrella, but you carrying an umbrella does not cause it to rain. Hello? Now, if you're praying for rain, you got faith, yeah, take your umbrella. But the, um, the, the rain's not coming because you got the umbrella. The rain's coming because you had faith for the rain. And so a lot of the problems that come with not only prophecy but other areas happens because of people not using correct logic or reasoning, and, and then they put in stuff that's not there. And so when I, when I call this the truth about prophecy, because I'm not telling you the book of Kent. This is not my opinion. I'm going to give you the word of God, and we're going to look at the truth about prophecy. Now, eventually we're going to get into some things that are prophetic, and we'll touch on some things even today. I'm going to get into some futuristic stuff. But a lot of what I'm doing is uh, Old Testament kind of stuff. Sister Brenda, I was saying last week about I thought, see, this is observation. So I want to distinguish between what we know the word of God says and then our opinions. And... Our opinion may just be our opinion for whatever reason, but if you search the Word of God and you come to the correct conclusion based on the proper amount of study, then you could move something from the opinion category into the reality category. So I said last week that my observation, what I think, what I haven't studied, I'm, I'm gonna take me, might take me a few, a few years to final, finalize this situation. <laughs> but what I think is that most prophecies in the Old Testament have already happened. So today, 
I, I don't know that I have time to, to blitz through the book of 1 Samuel, but I read the book of 1 Samuel today. I didn't just read it. I, I studied it all, all 31 chapters, and looking at prophecies. And so we saw this man of God show up, and, and what he does is he comes, and we're going to start with this, and then, as I said, toward the last 15 minutes or so, I want to take you to the book of Joel, where I was going to go last week. But um, I want to remind you of... Um, of what we have done so far. This is the third week, and we've given you some facts. A fact is something that is true. Fact number one is that some prophecies have a near part and a far part. I said some. Probably most prophecies just have one fulfillment. And a lot of prophecies, it's kind of no-brainer that there's only one fulfillment. But some prophecies have a double fulfillment. We'll get into that later on. But some prophecies, in that prophecy, part of it is happening now and part of it's in the future. And I gave you the example of Isaiah 61, where the first verse and a half of that chapter was fulfilled when Jesus came the first time and he read a verse and a half and he stopped because the rest of the, the, rest of the prophecy is still in the future. That demonstrates fact number one. Some prophecies have a near part and a far part. And the second fact we have, the truth about prophecy, is that some prophecies have ongoing fulfillment. And I gave you the illustration of the, of the, uh, the flood and the rainbow. And the rainbow is a symbol that God's not going to bring a flood again. But every single day that is ongoing fulfillment because it continues to happen. Every time it rains and every time you see the rainbow, booyah. Hadn't had a flood since the last flood that happened eons of time ago with Noah, and that, I mean, you're talking about universal flood, I'm not talking about a local regional flood, and we know that the, the rainbow is our reminder of that happening. So today I'm going to give you the third fact, and I'm not going to give it to you this moment, but we'll look at that in a moment. But we're going to look at the man of God and the prophecies that he gave, and, and I uh, have, uh, in doing this, I have pinpointed five prophecies that this man of God gave to Eli. And here they are. Prophecy number one. He says in chapter 2, verse 31, he says, no one in your family will live to old age. Rephrase that in the nice English. Nobody in your family is going to live to old age. Last part of that verse. There shall not be an old man in your house. Not going to have an old man in the house. Nobody is going to live to an old age. So my statement last week, Sister Brenda, about most prophecies I think have already happened. In the book of 1 Samuel, you're going to see that the prophecies within the book of 1 Samuel, if I can blaze through here, and I probably won't be able to, <laughs> but all of them happen usually within, during 1 Samuel or shortly after it. And this guy says that, they're not going to be the only old man in the house. Now, you'll recall that, and let's, let's see the third. Let's stop. Well, let me give you the second one. The second one is this. Uh, this is from verse 33. The second prophecy he gives is the only one not cut off is going to live to weep and grieve. The only one that's not cut off, it says they're going to consume their eyes to grieve thine heart. They're going to weep and they're going to grieve. Their eyes are going to be devastated. Their heartbreak will be devastated. That's the second prophecy. The third prophecy that he gives is, and he says, this is a sign. Verse 34, Hophni and Phinehas will die on the same day. So he's giving prophetic stuff, but some of it's going to happen a little later. But the very first thing that's going to happen is Hophni and Phinehas going to die on the same day, and when they die on the same day, you're going to know that's the sign that the rest of the stuff's going to happen. That's prophecy number three. Hophni and Phinehas, your two sons, Eli's two sons, are going to die on the same day. Prophecy number four, this is um, in verse number 21, God will raise up, uh, it's not verse 21, I'm sorry, what's that? God will raise up 
a faithful priest, and he will obey God, and his house will be established forever. That is prophecy number four. Prophecy number five is whoever is left in the house of Eli is going to beg the new priest for food and money. That's the five prophecies. He's going to beg for food and money. The Bible says it right there. He's going to want a piece of meat, a piece of bread, and he's going to a morsel of meat, a morsel of bread, a piece of silver, and a morsel of bread. He's going to be begging for food and money. So let's look at these five particular prophecies, and you will see that all of these things, all five of these, were fulfilled very quickly after this prophecy. So what happens is this. The first prophet that appears on the, the scene in 1 Samuel is the man of God who comes to Eli and gives these multiple prophecies. Then what happens is there's a boy in the house by the name of Samuel. And Samuel is just a child. but He's already destined to be a great man of God. And one day he has this Here's the voice, and he comes in there and says, Eli, to Eli, says, uh, you call me? And he says, no, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. He goes back and lays down. Here's the voice again, gets up. Eli, did you call? No, no, lay down. Third time, finally, the, the high priest says to him, look, son, Samuel, that's God talking to you. When he says it again, you, you listen to him. And basically what happens is when that takes place is that God doesn't go into detail with Samuel, but God tells Samuel what I have already told Eli. What the man of God has told Eli is going to come to pass, and there's nothing he can do about it. It's going to happen. And he comes to Eli, and Eli says, uh, don't, don't hide anything from his son. Just go ahead and tell me the truth. And, and Samuel says, tells him everything that God says, and Eli says, yeah, I know, I know that that is true. So let's start with the sign because it's the first one that happened. Eli was 98 years old. The Philistines were battling the children of God and the, the land of Israel, and the Philistines were defeating them. And um, somebody gets the idea, well, we need to get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it up here. And they bring the Ark of the Covenant up, and they set it up there, and the Philistines crush them, defeat them, and capture the Ark of the Covenant. And Hophni and Phinehas are killed, and a messenger comes to Eli, and 98-year-old Eli, Eli is 98 years old, and he's sitting on a bench, and the messenger comes with the bad news. And by this time, Eli is blind. He can't see. And the messenger says to him, the Ark of the Covenant is taken. The Philistines have defeated us. The Ark of the Covenant is taken, and Hophni and Phinehas have been killed. And when he hears the news of the Ark of the Covenant being taken, he's in such devastating shock that he falls off of his bench, and he breaks his neck, and he dies at the age of 98. And about the same time, Phinehas' wife is giving birth to a child, and she's heard the report Father-in-law's dead, husband's dead, brother-in-law's dead, ark of, the, of God is taken, and she has the child, hard labor, she's dying, and the last thing she does before she dies is she names him Ichabod, and she says, the glory has departed. The ark is taken, the glory has departed, and she dies. And so, 1 Samuel 4, we only know the names at this point. We only know the names of five people. Or the, we don't even know the name of the wife of Phinehas, but we only know about five people in the family of Eli. Eli dies, Phinehas dies, Hophni dies, Phinehas' wife dies. The only person that we know that survives is Ichabod. That's all we know. Now, because of this prophecy, we know that they're not all going to die because the Bible, we know that they're all going to die young. Because not an old man's going to be in your house. But we don't know, but we also know that they're not all going to be dead because the Bible says they're going to be, they're going to be a new priest. And by the way, I'm, I'm ahead of myself because I'm not going to get into tonight, but this new priest that's prophesied about is a man by the name of Zadok. Zadok will become the priest that takes over, um, that fulfills this aspect of the prophecy, and I'll touch on Zadok on another night, but not tonight. And so we, we know that from, again, the narrative of the Word of God. But the first fulfillment, the first of these five prophecies fulfilled is when Hophni and Phinehas die. And, and we see already the beginning of this cutting off of people of what transpires in this horrible, wretched situation that happens. And, and then um, 
we, we just know that, that there's Ichabod at this point. It's not until 10 chapters later in the 14th chapter of the book of, of 1 Samuel that we see 1 Samuel 14 and verse number 1. Let's, let's, let's go to verse 1 of 1 Samuel. Actually, let's go to verse 3. Um, so, so now we see the Scripture, and it says this, and this is the day, this is Solomon, I mean, excuse me, Saul is king. And Saul is king, and Ahiah, the son of Ahitab, Ahitab, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli. And now all of a sudden, we get some information about this family. And we find out that there's a priest named Ahiah, and he is the son of Ahitab, the son of Ichabod. Or excuse me, the, the brother of Ichabod. And Ich so Ahitab and Ichabod are sons of Phinehas and Eli. So, obviously, Ichabod had an older brother because Ichabod is a baby when his daddy dies. He's got this older brother named Ahitub, and Ahitub had a son named Ahiah who was priest, and he, he is the priest there in Shiloh because Saul says to him, I think 10 verses later in verse number, I believe it's verse 13, where Saul says, bring the ark, uh, uh, try f verse 14, um, it's all right, we don't find it, um, that's all right. Anyway, a little while later in that chapter, he tells him to bring the, it's, actually, it's verse 18, Saul says to him, bring the ark of God. So Saul says to Ahiah, bring hither the ark of God. So Ahiah is the priest. So the fulfillment of that Zadok prophecy hasn't taken place yet. We still see family here, and we find out that Ahiah is the son, if you put verse 3 back up, Ahiah is the son of a guy by the name of a high tub. Now, a high tub is a reoccurring name among the priest family. But we're looking down at this family, Sister Jenny, the family of Eli. Eli's dead, Hophni's dead, Phinehas dead. All we know about was Ichabod. Now we find out a high tub's alive. And now a high tub's son, a high is alive. But a high tub had another son. And another son was the priest at Nob. And his name was Ahimelech. Ahimelech was the priest at Nob. And you will recall this story. King David wasn't king yet. He was running from his life, for his life. And he was trying to escape Saul. And Saul was trying to kill him. And he comes to Nob to the house of Ahimelech, the priest of Nob. And he says to him, he says, have you got any bread here? Have you got any food here? And he says, all I have is the holy bread. And he said, you know, well, we, we, we're, we're doing all right here. We've done the right things. And, you know, and so he gives him the holy bread. And he says, you got any weapons? And he says, well, here's the, the sword of Goliath. And he takes the sword of Goliath. And there's a dirt bag there by the name of Doeg the Edomite. And I told my wife today, I said, you know, Doeg the Edomite is one of the people in the Bible I like the least. If there ever was a dirt bag, it was Doeg the Edomite. Because he butchers, slaughters, wipes out 85 priests. And so he's there and he sees it. Saul's trying to kill David. Saul, Saul's tracking down. And Saul's saying, where is that David? Can't find him. And, 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 and the dirtbag, the Edomite, the wig, he says, oh, I know what happened. He, he went down here. He went down here to this guy. Um, and, and the man gave him bread. And so the Bible says that Saul goes there, and Saul questions him, Ahimelech, an innocent man. And here's what we know about Ahimelech. Ahimelech is also the son of Ahitub. So Ahitub had two sons, Ahiah and Ahimelech, 1 Samuel 22 and 9 tells us that Ahimelech is the son of Ahitub. If you put that up, there it is. And then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Nod to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And so this horrible butchery of the slaughter of this family was part of the fulfillment of this prophecy against Eli. His family's wiped out. None of the men will get old.
Saul's very bitter. And this is what he says in verse 16. He's mad and angry at him. Him is an innocent man. He's an innocent man. He just he says, but David's your friend. David loves you. David's, David's he's always saying good things about you. He, I just gave some bread to David. He's a son-in-law. But Saul's not, not such a nice person. The king says, thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. You're going to die. And so Doeg the Edomite kills them, destroys them, and obliterates them. Thus we see definitely the fulfillment of this prophecy. No one in your family will live to an old age. None of them are going to make it to an old age. But one of his sons escapes. One man escapes from this group of people. Abiathar escapes and flees to King David. He's the one that escapes from this horrific situation that happens. Which, by the way, we noticed the statement also, one of these prophecies was, the people that survive are going to weep and grieve. Can you imagine? It's not imaginable. Some of you remember Sister Flo's self. Some of you didn't know her. Brother Clyde Self, the founder of his church, uh, his wife passed away, he moved to Maryland, remarried. Flo Self. Sister Flo was um, amazingly, uh, res- has strong resemblance for Sister Self number one, <laughs> which explains why he fell in love with her. <laughs> she just looked like a younger version of Sister Self number one. Flo Self, I don't know if you have any contact with her, she's still alive? I have no idea. Flo had no family. She had no brothers. She had no sisters. She had no mom, no dad, no cousins, nobody. The reason why she had no family is because she's Jewish and her entire family was annihilated by Hitler. And she escaped. Only one that survived. Came to the United States, grew up, converted to Christianity got the Holy Ghost, was in that church up there, Brother Self moved to Maryland, met her, could see that strong resemblance that all of us could see, <laughs> fell in love in like six weeks, proposed, and went to the pastor, and, and he said, you're moving kind of fast, and Brother Self said, in my age, I don't have time to move slow, <laughs> I ain't got much time here, and Brother Libby says, yeah, I can't argue with that. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's, you can't wrap your brain around it. Can you imagine all of your family being annihilated? I believe that she could relate to this young Abiathar who escaped with his life. She could understand Abiathar's situation. The ones that have survived are going to cry and weep. That's a reality. There is no place in Scripture that I can find where it describes the crying and the weeping, which leads me to the third truth about prophecy. There are plenty of Scripture we see in the Bible where it says, thus it is fulfilled. But the Scripture doesn't have to give you the explicit Fulfillment for it to have been fulfilled. In other words, my, my, the guy I like, Ahijah the Shilonite, Ahijah the Shilonite, when he told the wife of Jeroboam, your baby's going to die because God likes him. That's my paraphrase. The rest of you are devils. God's killing them all. God's going to kill you, your family, and what's going to happen is, is the dogs are going to eat you all, And then whatever the dogs leave, the birds are going to eat you. And God likes this. This boy right here, he's pretty good. And so, therefore, God's going to let him die, and you're all going to have a nice funeral for him, and everything's going to be good, and he's going to go to the grave in peace 
Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how old the child was. We don't know if he's two or seven or five or what. But, but, but the prophet says that God saw something pleasing in him, and therefore he wasn't going to exterminate him. And then the Scripture says when she gets back, the child dies just like he prophesied, and they had a funeral, and he's buried, and everything was like that. But there is no place in the Scripture where it says explicitly that I can find, maybe I need to look again, that the dogs were eating them and the birds were eating them. And here's my point. My point is if the Scripture says it, it happened, it happened. The Scripture didn't have to give you every little detail. It doesn't have to describe every little thing. So the third truth about prophecy is there is a lot of stuff that's prophesied in the Old Testament that happened just as it said, but there's no documentation or recording. Sometimes the documentation is historical. Sometimes history records what the Bible does not record. But there's a lot of the fulfillments of Old Testament prophecy that happened in those days that the Scripture didn't explicitly explain about it happening. Sometimes the scripture tells you this is what happened. Sometimes, here's what happens. Sometimes the scripture says this is what happened. But please notice what I just shared with you about that dirt bag, Doeg the Edomite, when he slaughters those people, the scripture doesn't say, and thus the words of the man of God to Eli were fulfilled. Doesn't say it. So unless you dig like I dig, like I dug today, because <laughs> yesterday I didn't even know that. Yesterday I was not even aware that that man, Ahimelech, was a grandson of Phinehas. Did not even realize that genetic connection because the scripture doesn't. So sometimes the Bible says, and this is fulfilled. And sometimes it just tells you the fulfillment and you don't even realize it's the fulfillment of prophecy. And sometimes it does not even present to you the thing that happened. And sometimes history records it. And sometimes there's no record of it in the Bible or history. But just because there's no record of it doesn't mean it didn't, it didn't happen exactly the way the Word of God said that it would happen. i got 20 minutes. Let's go to... Um, Let's go to another uh, prophecy. Um, <clears throat> this is in 1 Samuel 8 and 11 to 17. I won't take the time to read it, but this is 1 Samuel 8, 11 to 17. I'm going to tell you what happens here. In this passage of Scripture, the Bible tells us that they wanted a king, and Samuel says, I'm going to give you a king. That's what you want. But then he goes through, and I'm just going to, um, I'll just give you these just, in the, in, just because of expediting time. There's a series of, of uh, five prophecies that Samuel gives. Number one, he says the king's going to compel people to be his servants. The king's going to take your daughters as servants. Number three, the king is going to confiscate the best land and property of the people. Number four, the king is going to tax the people. And number five, the people are going to cry out against the king, but God's not going to help them. And I'm not going to go in great detail with these, these, these uh, five things, but let me just touch on them. The first one, of course, the king's going to compel the people to be his servants. That's in chapter 8, verse 11 through 12. The second one, the king's going to take your daughters as servants, 1 Samuel 8, 13. The third one, the king is going to confiscate the best lands and the property of the people. Now, let's, that's, on, that's, that's chapter 8, verse 16. So it's not meaning every single king. It's just telling you the things that kings do. So let's look at this one right here. This is uh, prophecy number three. King's going to confiscate the best lands and the property of the people. He's going to take away the best stuff. He's going to take your fields. He's going to take your vineyards. He's going to take your olive yards, even the best of them, and give it to his servants. Now, do you all recall this pretty bad dude named Ahab? And he saw, I want that vineyard. That's the fulfillment of that statement. See, Samuel is not giving you specific prophecies that are going to happen. He's just giving you generalized realities of the kind of things that are going to transpire, the kind of things that are going to happen. So the fourth prophecy, the king's going to tax the people. 
You're going to tax the people. Chapter 8, verse 15 and 17. We see it in verse 15. We see it again in verse 17. He's going to tax them. He's going to take a tenth of your sheep, and you shall be, right, whatever. <laughs> verse 17. He's going to take a tenth of your sheep, and you shall be a servant. And the last thing he says there in verse 8, 18, he says the people are going to cry out against the king, but God's not going to help them. You know why they had civil war? No, they didn't even have civil war. They just split up without a civil war. You know why they fragmented between the north and the south? The north was the northern ten tribes, and the south was the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. You know why? Because Solomon taxed them to death. And they're crying out about it. Sister Lula, they're crying out about it. And Rehoboam comes along and they're saying, could we have a little tax break here? And Rehoboam goes over there and asks his buddies. And they say, you know, the old guys say, tax break, tax break, tax break. And the young guys say, oh, man, tax them even more. Tell me you can be tougher. The Bible says they're going to cry, but God says, eh, I'm not worried about you. You brought it on your own self. You see the fulfillment of these things that Samuel says, the prophetic utterances. I want to get to, um, I want to get to um, um, this passage of scripture that I want to share with you in Joel. So I don't have time to take you through all of all of um, all of the book of First Samuel, but from my study today, all of these prophecies that I scrutinized, I want to share with you one prophecy because there's only one prophecy in the book of 1 Samuel that I have found that is yet to be fulfilled. Every other prophecy that I saw today as I went through here, I'm not even sure how many of them I saw because sometimes it's kind of hard, to, you know, when, when you see this diatribe that the man of God's on or Samuel's on, you, you know, I, I, I summarized them in a little phrase, but it's, sometimes it's like, is that two different things there or one thing there, <laughs> you know? There's only one prophecy in the entire book That hadn't been fulfilled completely. It has been fulfilled, but there's, this is that double thing going on now. And it's a very obscure scripture. It's very obscure. And the reason why it's very obscure is because it wasn't some man of God showing up and saying, I got a something more, word from God. Got a word from the Lord. Doesn't happen that way. It's a poem, it's a song. It's a praise, it's an adoration by a woman by the name of Hannah. And Hannah, in her praise and adoration in the second chapter, says all kinds of poetic stuff. And then the very last verse that she gets to as she is doing her praise is verse number 10. And she is talking about God and she says, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of, sh out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And you could argue that everything in this passage has been fulfilled. And you could argue that when the scripture says in the middle of that verse, the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, that's an ongoing reality of what God is doing. But I would submit to you that outside of that middle statement, the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, that all the rest of that stuff did happen in the book of 1 Samuel. And the last part of that verse, you could just apply that to King David. So let's look at it. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. That happens. That happens in the ministry, or the ministry, listen to me. That happens in the kingship of David and the crushing of the opposition of the enemies, the destruction of the enemies. That transpires. And that last statement in verse 10, the last half of the verse, he shall give the strength unto his king. Well, David got strength. And when Hannah said it, they had no king. And exalt the horn of his anointed. 
So I submit to you that this is prophetic, that Hannah in her praise and exaltation is saying something prophetic when there was no king. And the last part of that verse is about the future kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth. God's going to give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And so you could argue that this is fulfilled with King David, prophetic with King David, but you could also argue that there's a double fulfillment, and the double fulfillment will have its, its ultimate fulfillment within Jesus Christ. Outside of this one verse of Scripture, every other prophecy in this book that I found today, 1 Samuel, is about events that happen within a very short time or a few generations of the point in time of which it's given. So let me repeat these three things, and I'm going to take you to Joel chapter 2. These are the three facts that I have given you so far. One, fact number one, if I can find my, my notes from last week. Fact number one, well, let's give you fact number two because I remember it. Fact number two is some prophecies are ongoing. Fact number one is the fact that that um, some prophecies have a, a close-by fulfillment and some prophecies have a distant fulfillment, close and distant fulfillment. And then, of course, today um, we came up with fact number three, and that is that sometimes prophecies are given in Scripture, but, and they happen in Old Testament times, but the Scripture doesn't even record the happening so what am I telling you? I'm telling you that I believe that Jeroboam dogs ate him and the birds got the leftovers because the hides of the child not said it. Joel chapter 2, and I'm going to be revisiting Joel chapter 2 next week. I got nine minutes, and I want to share with you something that I was going to bring out last week, but I want to bring it out. Today, let's pick it up in the middle of Joel chapter 2. Um, I, I stopped reading. Oh, let's go to verse 12. Let's start there. Um, Joel is a um, three little chapters, and most of the book of Joel are is futuristic events. Most of the entire book of Joel is futuristic events. And um, I may touch on this again next week, but I wanted to go ahead and, and, uh, and get to it today. So let's pick it up. Verse 11, let's pick it up at verse 11. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? So when we see the phrase, the day of the Lord, it's talking about end time judgment, battle of Armageddon, return of Jesus Christ, second time. Uh, that kind of terminology. Therefore, also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me and all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And God is telling them to repent. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn into the Lord your God for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. So verse 13, I want you to notice this statement. Uh, some people would tear their garments and God says, why don't you uh, turn to God and tear up your heart? I'd be more, I'd be more impressed with you if, you'd, if you were affected than just tearing up some clothes. Verse 14, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering, a drink offering unto the Lord your God, blow the trumpet in Zion. <laughs> Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest, minister of the Lord, weep before the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen Heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? If you read all kinds of prophecies in the Old Testament, 
there's one thing, and, and this is the truth about prophecy. The truth is there's going to be a battle in Jerusalem, a futuristic battle. There's been a whole bunch of battles. There's been a whole bunch of bloodshed in Jerusalem. There's been a whole bunch of stuff that's happened. Do you know in, in 11, 1099, in the year 1099, every single Jewish person in Jerusalem was killed. There wasn't one left in, 11, in the year 1100. There were zero Jews left in Jerusalem because the year before in 1099 A.D., everyone was killed. The Muslims, Arabs, took over Jerusalem in the 600s. And from the 600s to the 1900s, for the majority of that time, Islam ruled Jerusalem. Man, Jerusalem just keeps getting wiped out and rebuilt, annihilated, reconstructed. And this stuff right here in Joel 2 is futuristic. So I want you to understand something. Jerusalem is a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. Hello? Jews are trying to move back there. Christians are not trying to go there, except to visit. <laughs> okay? Don't move, don't advise anybody to move to Jerusalem. I read the book. It ain't going to be pretty. It hadn't been pretty. And it's not going to be. And Joel 2 is just one of many prophetic utterances of the devastation that will come upon Jerusalem. Verse number 18. Then will the Lord be jealous of his land and pity his people. Destruction's coming to Jerusalem. But the Lord is going to have pity on his people. He's going to have pity on them. Verse 19. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. The day is coming where you will no longer be a reproach among the heathen. We're going to look at this some more in the future. But this chapter right here hadn't happened yet. This is futuristic. Verse number 20, but I will remove far, from, uh, far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up <clears throat> and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beast of the field. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield her strength. Be glad, then ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the rain, former, former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month, and the floors shall be full of wheat. And the fat shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you, and you shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Good days are coming. Good days are coming to Israel. Verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, <clears throat> that I am the Lord, your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterwards. Everybody say afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons 
and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servant and upon the handmaiden in those days I will pour out my spirit, Woo! and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great, terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, i got one minute. So this is that place where I say to be continued. Because I have an aha I want to share with you. And I can't say it in a minute. But let me just say this, you know, you know that part of this scripture I just read to you, the last five verses of this chapter are quoted on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Oh, but verse 28. Sister Eva, verse 28, it shall come to pass after. And that ain't what Peter said. Peter said, in the last days saith God. Put that up, Acts 2.17. I can do this in a minute. I'm going to come back and revisit this, but I want to I wanna tell you this before I let you go. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. I'm going to pour my spirit upon living flesh. I read this in the Septuagint. That's the Greek. I'm talking about Joel. I read it in the Septuagint. That's the Greek Old Testament translation. And then I read it, Acts 2, in the Greek New Testament. And I realized something. Whoo! The Old Testament unsaved, in the last days, saith God. The Old Testament says that afterwards. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Here's what happens. Woo! All of Acts chapter, excuse me, of, of Joel chapter 2 is a futuristic promise to the Jews that the day is coming when everything is going to be going wrong in Jerusalem and God's going to come to Jerusalem where they've been beat up and battered and knocked this way and knocked that way and everything else, whatever way, and the day is coming when God is going to come, when the Lord is going to come to Jerusalem and restore them and conquer them and no longer will there be a problem. And afterwards, God's going to pour out his spirit upon all living flesh. So what Peter says is this. When Peter says, it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, Peter wasn't quoting from Joel. Sister Beverly, Peter was speaking under the unction of the Spirit of God, and he was saying what just happened to us is a fulfillment of this little piece of this scripture, but the ultimate fulfillment is yet to come 
Because what Joel was saying is the outpouring of the baptism of God's Spirit upon the Jewish people will happen when Jesus comes back. There will be a pouring out of his Spirit on the Jewish people. And the same thing that happened 2,000 years ago when God poured out his Spirit upon the, the early church they received his spirit because they accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And when they accepted Christ as the Messiah and they received his spirit, they spoke in another language as the spirit of God gave them utterance. And the spirit of God poured out upon them. But the day is going to come when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and the Jews in Jerusalem will realize he is the Messiah. And when they accept him, they will receive the baptism of his spirit and they will speak in a new language as the Spirit of God gave the utterance because that's the day when they'll become a Christian. Hello, hallelujah, and glory to God. Still to be continued. God bless you. You are dismissed in the fear of the Lord.